In this video, I'll be talking about uh, double integrals and polar coordinates, and the main idea here is that sometimes uh, some regions that we want to integrate over are better described using polar coordinates, and it's good to have a method for dealing with those regions. So what I have in mind is, let me give a few simple examples. Just take the unit circle. If I want to integrate over, over the region inside the unit circle, um, I could describe this using x and y, but it's, it's really rather messy because um, you know, x goes from negative 1 to 1, but then when you're in here, uh, you go from negative square root of 1 minus x squared to the positive square root of 1 minus x squared. But in polar coordinates, this region, we would just say it's described by, well, the radius goes from, goes from 0 to 1, and the angle theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. And some other regions that are easy to describe with polar coordinates are things that look like this. Say we have a region bounded by these two rays and by two arcs of circles. So if I started at, say, theta 1 and went to theta 2, and let's say this radius is r1 and the big radius is r2, a region like this can be described in polar coordinates as All points with polar coordinates r and theta, such that r is between r1 and r2, and theta is between theta1 and theta2. So these are the, the types of regions that uh, polar coordinates was designed to describe. And now, the way we integrate in polar coordinates, let me give away the punchline and just tell you we think of dA. In rectangular coordinates, we usually think of this as dx dy, or dy dx. And it's supposed to represent the area of a tiny infinitesimal rectangle. But in polar coordinates, uh, we'll be replacing dA with, with r dr d theta. And the reason is, let me take one of these regions like so. If I have a function defined in the plane and I want to integrate it over this region, I can approximate it in a different way, not using rectangles, but instead dividing it up into what we might call polar rectangles. So I draw a bunch of rays like I have done here and then draw a bunch of arcs of circles and I could, so if I have some function in mind, say f of x, y, and I want to find the double integral over this region, a way to approximate this that's different that, from what we've seen before is to, is to think of, um, well, pretend these are little squares. They aren't squares, but they're close to being squares and compute volumes of, of rectangular prisms above these. So maybe I should draw this in three dimensions. I have some shape that looks like this. And I have some curve above it. I'm sorry, I have a surface above it. So over this region, I have some surface above. And the way I'll approximate this volume is with these little shapes. So I'll take, let me redraw it over here. I'll pick a height of the function at one of the corners and draw a shape like this. 
Maybe this is easier to see over here. And I'll compute volumes of these that sit under, under the surface nicely. And the problem here is that, well, we, the thing we want to compute is sort of the area of the base of one of these times the height. So we're essentially computing the area of one of these small shapes times the value of the function at some point to give you a height of one of these uh, things that sort of looks like a rectangular prism, but it's not quite a rectangular prism. So the idea is, well, we've divided the region into a bunch of small pieces that all look like this. So say this is a tiny change in theta, and say the length distance we're at is r, and this region is obtained by, by taking a tiny change in r, a, a good approximation to the area of this shape turns out to be r delta theta delta r because a good approximation to the length of this arc is well the length of that arc actually is r times delta theta if we pretend that's a straight line which which does make sense when when delta theta is small enough then we have the length here times the length here to give us an approximation to the area of this. So that's one way to explain why um, why dA should be thought of as r dr d theta. Um, so let me go through a specific example of how you would use this in a problem and maybe uh, explain a little later, uh, or go into more depth on why exactly we have r d r d theta. So for example, say we want to find the volume enclosed by z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared and the xy plane. So this, this right here is an upside down paraboloid. And the region that we get enclosed is just this dome shape. And to, to answer this question, really what we're doing is finding the volume under the graph of this function, but over the unit circle, because uh, when z is equal to zero, we just have an equation of the unit circle. So really, the thing we're computing is the double integral of 1 minus x squared minus y squared over the unit um, unit disk, I should say. And the way we describe this, uh, the way we can write this in polar coordinates is, like I said, we think of the little change in area as r d r d theta. In polar coordinates, x squared plus y squared is r squared. And the unit disk in polar coordinates can just be described by R is between 0 and 1, and theta is between 0 and 2 pi. So now let me write down uh, the integral we could compute in polar coordinates, which would give us the answer to this question. That will be the following iterated integral. Our function is 1 minus r squared times r dr d theta r goes from 0 to 1, and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So recall, this is just another way of writing 1 minus x squared minus y squared, 
and this is our expression for dA in polar coordinates. And I won't go through the details now, but this is just a regular iterated integral using these variables r and theta. Uh, 